welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, the first night of our series, Contested Environments. Um, and we'll be discussing how new media environments like games, memes, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, fora on the internet, uh, are also the place where public debate takes place, where public and political opinion making is being done, um, and how political influence is uh, being exercised, uh, even up until influencing uh, elections, uh, as we've all been experienced sing over the past few years. Um, this is the first uh, evening in the series, the kickoff evening, um, Bullshit's Birthplace. Um, and as a guest, we have Oilab from Amsterdam, uh, a laboratory connected to the University of Amsterdam. Um, they will be presenting uh, various parts of their uh, research and share it with us and hopefully also enter into discussion with you as the audience uh, about the specific elements of their research. Um, so as the moderator of tonight, because I'm only the one opening tonight, um, I'll give the mic uh, to Mark Tudors um, and he will, uh, he will be uh, taking you to the rest of the program. So please a warm applause for Mark Tudors. Thank you, Arjen. Um, so I guess you can switch over to the other channel. So, who oh, yes. fucking cares? anarchist shit disturber and to becoming an ironical reactionary as a terrorist. With my newfound powers, I released a plague of frogs. That shit got super weird and I basically lost my mind. Now I'm pretty much beyond hope at this point, but so is the world, as everybody knows. So, who fucking cares? So these uh, are bumper videos that Kim De Hoot has made, and she and she will she will uh, speak briefly about them at the uh, end. Uh, I'm Mark Tudors, and uh, I'll be uh, introducing some research today from uh, the Open Intelligence Lab uh, and friends um, that looks into Anglo-American meme culture. Uh, and there will be three case studies today um, of the so-called Great Meme War of 2015 to 2617, approximately. My God. And uh, <clears throat> these three presentations uh, that will, uh, following, following me, um, are going to be these kind of like academic presentations uh, for a general audience that mix uh, qualitative and quantitative research methods, and then those will be followed by two artist presentations. Um, and all these presentations are concerned with 4chan uh, and as the birthplace of proverbial internet bullshit, which is the title of the, uh, the event this evening. So, um, <clears throat> so bullshit is, I'm going to do an introduction now. So bullshit is a technical term actually in information theory, and it comes from an influential essay by a analytic philosopher by the name of Harry Frankfurter. And the basic idea is, it, it's, it's developed in contrast to the idea of a lie, of a lie or a liar. So if a liar is consciously, um, involved in producing mis- or disinformation um, with the aim to intentionally mislead, the bullshitter is in a sort of a different category in this kind of uh, analytic 
uh, philosophical distinction, which is, uh, has, has a certain influence in information theory now. The bullshitter in this other category is actually kind of concerned primarily with making emotionally engaging narratives. Um, so with the, what he calls the art of bullshit, the main point is to make um, possible a high level of candor um, and that, uh, so that people who, uh, who are then involved in this, the art of bullshit, are encouraged to convey what's on their minds, okay? Uh, and and in, in doing so, they don't have to be necessarily worried or concerned about being held accountable to what is, in fact, the truth. They can just kind of go along with the bullshit. So, Trump is classic bullshitter, and for that matter, so would be somebody like Boris Johnson. Um, and possibly, this is possibly one of the reasons why Trump became a meme, in fact, on 4chan, around about this time in the American election cycle four years ago. And actually, there's another guy who is becoming a meme on 4chan as well, which we could talk about in the question period. The question then would be, does Trump actually believe in the stuff that he spreads, the bullshit that he spreads. Does he believe that Ob Obama was secretly Muslim? Does he believe that Ted Cruz's dad was possibly involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy? These are things that he promoted. He, in fact, he became famous for the, the first one. Um, and uh, I would say no, uh, he doesn't. Uh, but as a showman, he, he intuits that people feel uneasy about something. They feel uneasy, for example, about Obama. He doesn't seem like one of them, um, and Cruz. And so he creates narratives that express that unease in the form of a kind of a superficially coherent conspiracy. So these conspiracies aren't meant to be taken at face value. Rather, bullshit is meant to create a kind of an atmosphere of innuendo. Um, and this innuendo then in turn sows doubt about the way that things really are. Uh, as the philosopher Hannah Arendt noted, this is a classic technique of authoritarian leaders. Uh, the uh, idea of evoking an aura of kind of mysteriousness, of nebulous mysteriousness in the populace, often by endless repetition of the same sort of theme. Um, and under these kind of conditions of totalitarianism, Arendt wrote that the, pol that the populace then comes to doubt reality itself. In her words, they don't trust their eyes and their ears and um, come only to trust in their own imaginations. So that opens up an enormous field of possibilities then for the authoritarian populist leader. And under such conditions, oh, can we have a volume? There we go. Uh, under such conditions, um, the evidence of a conspiracy seems to be everywhere. Um, I will have another audio clip later. Um, so uh, what has to take place in order for uh, things to get to this point uh, is, is a rather complex matter. And there's a whole literature on the rise of nationalist populism. And in this literature, in particular this book, they speak of the four Ds. And those four Ds are distrust, which is, which is to say low levels of public trust in the liberal establishment. Um, and that would also include the media, the mainstream media, MSM as it's called. Uh, destruction, the destruction of long-held um, communal identity via the forces of globalization. Relative deprivation um, via neoliberal economics that has led to a rise in inequality, a rise in the so-called Gini coefficient. And finally, de-alignment, um, which is to say de-aligning from traditional institutions and also traditional parties towards smaller marginal parties. So, for example, the, the recent election and, the, and how some of the, these very small uh, parties like the Forum did quite well in this country. In, in the United States in 2016, the uh, US uh, election experienced a kind of a proliferation of bullshit in the terms of fake news. This is a famous graphic uh, representing this. Um, it found, this was a study by BuzzFeed, and they found that bullshit had outperformed real news on Facebook. Um, and while individual stories 
were always, almost always immediately debunked, the narratives that underpinned them persisted, as with the case that Obama uh, was a Muslim. And they, those narratives confirmed people's suspicions. Uh, conspiracy theory has, in the kind of literature, been traditionally treated as kind of a problem of low information. People don't have enough information. Um, but in the uh, US, you can also see that in the context that I just brought up a moment ago, that there's also something very particular going on at this moment in time, that there's all time, kind of record high distrust in political institutions and in the mainstream media. And this makes, uh, this arguably has made many people willing to entertain these kind of outlandish ideas along the lines of the theories that I expressed a moment earlier. So um, furthermore, it turns out that in some cases, people are in fact just sort of less committed to the truth than they are to, um, to sort of being part of a team. Um, and that is very much seen in this famous instance of Trump's inaugural crowd size, right? The famous moment when um, Kellyanne Conway spoke of alternative facts. Um, what, he, Trump claimed that his crowd was, the, was much bigger than Obama's crowd and the photographs seemed to say otherwise. And this, what can account for this is an idea that psychologists refer to as motivated reasoning, which basically has to do with the idea that people collect information that is consistent with their own views, and then contradictory evidence like this serves only to kind of confirm that there is in fact a kind of a conspiracy. So in some cases, people then could be said to believe in the bullshit, or at least they act as though they believe in the bullshit when it suits their purposes. When it suits their purposes, maybe to say, screw you, liberal establishment, this is what we believe, we don't care what you think to be the truth. So uh, like Pizzagate uh, and, uh, and QAnon, which you're gonna hear about in, in, a, in a, a few moments, um, these kinds of examples can, uh, can be seen in relation to the, the four Ds. Um, uh, as we'll see, these narratives are, however, um, patently ridiculous. Um, uh, amongst those who circulate them, um, people, various kind of alt-right Twitter trolls whose names don't need to be mentioned, it's probably fair to assume that most of them don't, in fact, really believe in these stories. However, um, because these two, ex uh, these two examples, along with Kekistan, come from 4chan, it's really, in fact, as we'll see in a moment, it's hard to know what people really believe at all, in fact, when you get, come into these kinds of uh, parts of the internet, and whether or not it, it is, in fact, uh, a, a sort of a statement of belief, or if it's something that we could call shitposting, um, that, that has a very specific purpose. So shitposting is the name for a kind of clickbait content, content that's posted by internet trolls. Um, the little representation of the little dancing figure on the left. And it's intended to trick people into acting a certain way in order to de derail a conversation. So trolls use shit posts to trigger people. These days, their favorite target is the social justice warrior whose liberal tears are delicious. Um, and as with Pizzagate, QAnon, and Kekistan, um, shit posting can be much more elaborate than just sort of one, sort of, uh, annoy, one, one a meme that is att attempting to annoy somebody. Um, these examples that we're going to be seeing this evening are all instances of very complex sort of world building um, that started on 4chan and then kind of went elsewhere. Um, and on 4chan, um, the people who uh, uh, participate in 4chan, who, who refer to themselves as anons, built these kind of alternate realities out of fragments of facts, um, and then they mixed these together with their own internet ver vernacular. For example, the fact that on 4chan, the word pizza has a very different meaning, which you may hear about later. Um, and this is then served up, kind of mixed together into a sort of a bullshit cocktail for the une unexpecting normies, who are the people who are not in on the joke. So Pizzagate took existing long-standing, for example, took existing long-standing anti-Clinton narratives and grafted them onto WikiLeaks emails that were strategically released by Vladimir Putin at just the right moment to create 
what in US politics is called an October surprise, which is an attempt to redirect the narrative just days before the election. And QAnon did something similar with the Mueller investigation. And Kekistan, which is slightly different from those two, can be also understood as a kind of an exercise in shitposting social justice warriors and also as a kind of a bullshit identity politics. So all of these stories emerged from uh, 4chan and also from 8chan, uh, which is similar. And, they, and these things can be considered to belong to something that we call the deep vernacular web. And this is a term that we use for an anarchic image, the, these anarchic image boards um, and, and also this sort of general comment culture that has been referred to uh, by a scholar in our field as the bottom half of the internet. And as we'll see, the deep vernacular web is very importantly, um, for the most part, anonymous and ephemeral, which makes it very distinct from social media. So it can be considered as supporting a distinct kind of subculture partially because of these technical affordances. And they have their own ways of doing things there, their own rules, laws, axioms, and so forth. Um, and many of them see themselves as, in fact, the true web natives who've been around for a long time. In fact, they, they, they would see their culture as predating social media and even in some cases predating the web itself. This is a graphic that uh, represents that idea. So um, with Anonymous, which many of you uh, may be familiar with, um, the deep vernacular web had a kind of, uh, with the an, an large A Anonymous, I mean to say, the deep vernacular web had an impressive, if somewhat ambiguous, track record of um, activism dating back at least a decade. In recent years, however, there's been a turn towards a kind of more reactionary form of politics with the emergence of the alt-right. Um, from their digital native perspective, you know, where they have a history that goes quite some ways back, um, one might say that they see themselves as being sort of, call, their, their space is being colonized by corporate social media, um, and that they're kind of being squished into a little reserve of image boards, whereas once they had a bigger share of the web. And in, and in light of the four Ds that I mentioned before from nationalist populism, this may help us to understand how there may exist certain resonances between this subculture and the rise of nationalist populism with their specific set of the four Ds grievances. So for on 8chan, uh, one and on um, was in fact the Christchurch shoot shooter from just a couple of weeks ago. And his, uh, or at least he posted his, to, uh, to 8chan prior to this uh, incident. And his, his manifesto was entitled The Great Replacement. And that actually, that term, The Great Replacement, is actually a term that comes from the French New Right that could also be associated with parties who are very much engaged with national populist ideas, such, for example, as I would suggest Thierry Baudet's Forum for Democracy. Um, so associations between Chan culture, the deep vernacular web, and radicalism are, in fact, a serious cause for concern. That is something that needs to be stated. Whether real Anons, if we can speak of such a thing, are committed to alt-right ideology is also a question. The reason for this is the same reason that many Anons were in fact uneasy with large A Anonymous back at the time. Um, and so while the deep vernacular web is always changing, as you can see from this difference between the earlier uh, progressive activism and the more recent reactionary activism, they've always been committed to a certain kind of an idea of play. And if there were a single mantra for this deep vernacular web, it would in fact be the idea that the internet is serious business, which is to say that it is not, and anyone who thinks that it is should be ridiculed for not getting it. So while this does not make, uh, while this does not make, th uh, make them in, sorry, while this does in a sense make them reactionary and also nihilistic, we have to be careful in taking anything here at face value. And that's, I think, the warning that, that I will give you guys before we start in with the presentations that we'll be following. Um, and so now that I've offered you this intro. You know the rules 
and so do I. I will pass the mic to Emilia. That's right. When super giant pizza, plain, nothing on it, and I'd like that delivered as soon as possible. Girls, your pizza's here. Thank you. Dear Tony, I'm so looking forward to the spirit cooking dinner at my place. Do you think you will be able to let me know your brother is joining? I think we're just about ready to build the perfect pizza. Pizza. Oh my love, Marina Abramovich. Hi, so my name is Emilia Jokubowskaita. I am a part of the Open Intelligence Lab and also a media studies uh, lecturer at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, as you could see from the video and from what Mark mentioned before and from the slide, uh, you can expect that I will be talking about the Pizzagate conspiracy. Do any of you know about this conspiracy? Okay. Quite a few. Um, and more broadly, I will talk about a little bit about what Mark also mentioned, the affordances of uh, anonymity and ephemerality on 4chan and how they can create this unique bullshit birthing environment on the platform. Um, um, so if we talk about the affordances of uh, 4chan, we may start with the most obvious of them, it's the anonymity. Um, and on the screen here you can see a typical um, 4chan slash poll post, so uh, post on a politically incorrect uh, board on 4chan, which is the most active and the biggest board on this platform. And uh, it's followed by two comments, um, and you can see that the users have no screen names, and definitely no offline identity is presented on the board. Um, they are anonymous by default, but uh, they can choose a pseudonym if they wish to. Uh, there's an ID attached as well, uh, but it's only uh, consistent within one thread. And the two comments underneath that uh, contain the word bump, bring me to my next slide, is this one and it talks about the ephemerality of this platform. Um, so it's probably the most important uh, affordance in this case, talking about Pizzagate. Uh, so if you open 4chan slash Paul and uh, looked at the top threads and then you refresh the page, so you could see that um, the top threads very rapidly change. So most probably every time you refresh it, you will see something new at the top. Uh, and it can be imagined as a torrent that washes everything away. Um, so how does it work? Every time when uh, someone posts something on the board, with every new post, that post sinks down by one position and with every new comment on that post, it is bumped back to the top. And you can see here how they change. Uh, this is a visualization of an hour of thread positions on 4chan slash Paul queried every two minutes. Um, uh, the red ones uh, representing the threads with a lot of comments and the blue ones representing the threads of uh, a few comments. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that there is a finite number of uh, threads on the board, so once you're lower than that last uh, position, you're off the board and you just uh, simply are washed away and you disappear and you can be forgotten. Um, and there's also a finite number of comments that are allowed under one post, so 
if most of the time, if they reach over 300, um, what happens is that every new comment doesn't bump the post uh, to the top anymore and they just simply wash away. And you can see uh, that at the bottom of the visualization uh, with the red ones, which were active, but they just disappeared off the board. Um, so these two affordances of anonymity and ephemerality bring me to general threads and then to the Pizzagate conspiracy, finally. So while you can see that discussions that happen on 4chan could simply be forgotten after a very short period of time, um, the anons, the users of uh, this platform, have this cultural practice of general threads uh, to circumvent that. And you can see an unrelated example of that on the screen, which is the President Trump generals. Uh, so what they do is before every th uh, the thread disappears of the board, they copy the content of the opening post and they post it again, uh, sometimes with additional information, sometimes just a copied version of the old post. And this is how the conversation can continue. Um, so here it's roughly every half an hour. Uh, but they differ, and we believe that one specific general thread, this is the Pizzagate general, uh, gave birth to the conspiracy. So, but let's rewind here. For those of you who don't know what Pizzagate is, it's a story that went whoops, uh, viral in September of 2016 when a man with an assault rifle came into one of the pizza places in Washington, D.C. in what he thought was an attempt to rescue children that were kept there. Um, uh, more than that, conspiracy uh, features Hillary Clinton, Satanism, pedophilia, linking Hillary's team with pizza places around Washington, D.C., uh, which were thought to be serving children to the team and that they engaged with some satanic, pedophilic rituals uh, with them. Um, it, there has been much written about the dissemination of this theory and in many ways how it is not true, but we were interested in the origins of the story and uh, we believe that they are on 4chan slash Paul and they happened just in 25 hours uh, on November second and third of 2016. So this is where it all starts in this post. Um, the anons start uh, being interested in this one uh, WikiLeaks Podesta email, uh, which in the subject line has only pizza.jpg, and it has an image of girls eating pizza attached, and the body of the email says one thing, um, it doesn't get any better than this, which is weird. Um, but um, So preoccupied with this mystery, the users of 4chan, or vernacular researchers as we may call them, start looking at other emails looking for findings and they discuss uh, possible code words such as pe uh, cheese pizza for child pornography and they look for those uh, codes and other emails and they try to understand this whole uh, situation. Um, so, and you also may think, why was Marina Abramovich in the video that we saw before? Uh, the conspiracy theorists also find her emails sent to Podesta uh, very interesting because she talks about this spirit cooking dinner and uh, which they seem to think that means that the members of Hillary's team engage in some sort of satanic rituals. Um, so what happens next is in the 25 hours, 19 Pizzagate uh, general threats are born on 4chan slash poll. Uh, and the conspiracy theory is developed through copying the re relevant old and new bullshit into the body of the opening post. Uh, external archives are used, they use a lot of pastebin links and Google Docs links on those posts where they kind of summarize the information. And the ma main body of the conspiracy is kind of gradually accumulated 
in this ephemeral environment where you would think these discussions could disappear if these general threats did not start appearing, they were not copied any, uh, before disappearing. So looking at these users of 4chan slash Paul as vernacular researchers, uh, we can categorize their comments in, in categories of uh, methods. Uh, for example, here, uh, archiving or posting on other platforms or discussing sources. Uh, but the crystallization of this conspiracy can be seen in the visualizations of their findings that they make. So in the top left in purple, one Anon is commenting, my brain is exploding, trying to organize the connections. Anyone have diagrams? And this happens in the first hours of the conspiracy creation already. Um, and what is born out of that? One visualization actually Mark showed before. Another one is here. Um, it's an example. It shows a map of all child-related businesses near the DC pizza parlor uh, that the logos of them seem similar to symbols apparently used by pedophiles. And locations seem to line up in a form of a satanic pentagram. So I would like to finish off uh, my part by um, saying that because of the nature of this platform, we may not understand if uh, how much of the birth of this theory was based on uh, users who actually believed in what they were researching or simply shit posters. And however, in this case, we were able to see, observe how the unique affordances can set the stage for a conspiracy like that to be born. So I will pass on to Stein now. Um, my name is Stein, and I want to talk about another conspiracy theory that also originated on 4chan. Being a Q and um, I suppose was this just um, brilliantly introduced by the video that Kim made. So Q and um, is another conspiracy theory. It also involves American politics, um, and it also originates on 4chan. And the core of the conspiracy is a character um, named Q, pretending to be named Q. Um, it's not quite clear who Q is. But what is clear is that they, um, he, she, it, posts clues, um, information, breadcrumbs of information on 4chan. At least that's how it started. So these are some examples of posts Q made, allegedly made on 4chan. And they all hint at a conspiracy, at something going on behind the scenes in American politics. And um, the pattern that you find in these posts and other ones, uh, also made by Q, are that they're hinting at something um, going on in the White House, near the White House. It all involves President of the United States, the Clinton Foundation, um, plane crashes, etc. I think that's a reference to 9-11. So what ties all of this together is that it hints at some kind of conspiracy, that it hints at some kind of pattern, something going on behind the scenes, but there's no actual substance in there. There's no information that you can use to check whether this Q character is actually legit. 
where the queue actually exists as someone in the White House, and um, is actually someone that knows Trump, that is able to share information. And very similar to the conspiracy theories that Emilia and Mark discussed, um, that didn't stop people from latching onto this and starting discussions about it um, on 4 again, trying to combine these breadcrumbs into some kind of grounds unified theory about what was going on in the White House um, and how the White House was fighting against the deep state um, uh, and how Trump was uh, doing what is planned to drain the swamp. So this is the start of, of QAnon, um, of Q, Q posting on 4chan. And in a lot of ways, this is just another 4chan meme, just another 4chan conspiracy theory. But then um, an interesting thing happened that a few months later, you could see stuff like this happening. So people showing up at Trump rallies, um, wearing Q t-shirts, wearing Q signs, um, shouting Q slogans. So, I mean, there's some overlap between 4chan, especially the politics boards, and Trump supporters, but there's a lot of people in there that you wouldn't find on 4chan, right? It's normies, as Mark called them. Um, people that wouldn't be aware of 4chan, wouldn't know how it works, wouldn't be up to date with the vernacular. So the question that we asked was how something that was started out as another 4chan meme, another 4chan conspiracy theory, ended up being normified and ended up being something that actually had a place in political discourse in the United States and um, on Trump rallies. So together with uh, a few colleagues and a few students, we um, looked at a number of platforms on which Q was discussed and shared, um, starting at what Mark referred to as the, the bottom half of the internet, the underbelly, 4chan, uh, 8chan, and moving up to the mainstream media, where, um, again, Q ended up being discussed. So I'll just try to briefly go through this platform by platform to see how that worked, how the process of normification brought QAnon um, from a meme theory to the mainstream. So we start at 4chan and 8chan. Um, 8chan basically being 4chan, but with even less restrictions on what you can say there. So you find a lot of extreme stuff there. And the in interesting thing here is that a Q, or someone pretending to be Q, on 4chan at some point said, I've been compromised, I'm moving from 4chan to 8chan. Um, which is very puzzling, but that's what they said. Um, so you see that there is an initial peak of activity on 4chan concerning Q. Um, and then Q made their announcement that they were moving on to 8chan. And as you can see, after that, the discussion on, Q, on 4chan kind of died down and 8chan became very active in terms of uh, Q breadcrumbs and theorizing about those. So this is kind of the, the cradle of the conspiracy theory where it all started and where it was discussed for a long time, only briefly on 4chan, then for a long time on 8chan. And then we um, move up to uh, the platform hierarchy in terms of deepness, perhaps, um, to Reddit. Oh, yeah, this is an example um, very similar to the conspiracy threats Amelia just showed on how uh, a general threat about QAnon, which was basically the way this was discussed on 4chan and 8chan. So we move on to Reddit which is kind of a mix of mainstream and fringe communities. Um, there's a lot of mainstream communities there, fandom, just general political discussion, etc. but also a lot of fringe communities um, that can be quite extreme in their political beliefs or um, in what they're interested in. So this, this is the activity on Q on Reddit, um, which kind of lags behind 4chan a little bit, started a little bit later than, than 4chan and 8chan, but kept on going longer. Um, so there was a... a um, not too active, but sustained discussion about QAnon there. And what is useful here to, to um, point out is that Reddit, as I said, is a bit of a mix between mainstream and fringe. So QAnon here moves on from the very fringe, um, 4chan and 8chan, to something that's a little bit more mainstream, a little bit more normified maybe, being Reddit. Um, just a brief impression of what Reddit looks like if you're not familiar with it. It's, it's still kind of basic in terms of interface, or at least used to be. They recently had an update, but this is what it looks like. Um, but there's a lot of communities there discussing um, their own interests, and some of those were discussing Q. So from Reddit, we move on to YouTube. And um, again, we see that activity surrounding Q slowly rises from the beginning of the, um, the idea of Q. 
uh, until the uh, peak as around September 2018, which I'll come back to later, which is a, an important moment in Q discourse. So on YouTube, there are a lot of communities of people trying to dis dissect um, Q's breadcrumbs and uh, connecting Q to Donald Trump's mysterious and amazing hand signs, for example. Um, as you also saw in the intro video, there's this idea that Donald Trump does something with his hands that hints at Q being either legit or um, at a, a breadcrumb that uh, Q recently dropped. For example, Trump uh, uses him. I, don't, I can't actually make this sign, something like this or this. Anyway, he does that and it's kind of like a Q, so that might be a hint that Q is actually legit. I mean, that, that's the level of theorizing we're talking about here. But there's a lot of people dissecting that kind of stuff on YouTube. In, um, and again, uh, continuing this process of normification, YouTube obviously also has a lot of far more mainstream, uh, benign stuff. So if you're watching a video, you might see this kind of video recommended, um, which brings QAnon a little more credibility than it had if you would just see it on 4chan. So moving up to the, uh, through the platforms, you get Q, you, you see Q in a context that's, far, that's increasingly more mainstream and maybe normalizes the whole thing a little bit more. And moving on then to Facebook, um, which is perhaps the most mainstream of all social media platforms, um, especially in terms of how many people are on there. Uh, you see the similar pattern. There's, a, there's a, an increase in activity that lags a little behind um, YouTube in this case and also culminating in a peak of activity around October 2018. But um, you could, the interesting thing here is that obviously if people talk about Q on Facebook, you would see it in your timeline next to uh, the things your friends and family share, next to the pages you trust sh uh, share. So again, the, the context of Q becomes a little more mainstream there and a little more normified. And then finally, this all culminates in mainstream media attention. So in October 2018, a lot of media outlets, mainstream media outlets, uh, broadcasters, newspapers started talking about Q. Um, this is uh, one of the biggest articles from that time by the Washington Post. It's not actually that positive about Q. It calls it a, a deranged conspiracy cult um, that leaps from the internet to the crowd at Trump's MAGA tour. So. On the one hand, you would say, okay, well, this would maybe turn people off QAnon, right? Because it's very clear from this article, if you would read it, that it's just nonsense, it's just bullshit. On the other hand, to an extent, um, all attention is good attention here in that this, this does bring Q and QAnon to an audience that wouldn't have uh, heard of 4chan, wouldn't know how to use 4chan. So you could say this is the culmination of that normification process where something moves from 4chan to 8chan. And the Washington Post here describes it as um, a leap from the internet to Trump's MAGA tour. And I think if we go back to kind of the overall picture, um, it's not so much a leap as a, as a gradual process. So you can see that at the bottom, 4chan chart started it, but then when the mainstream media started paying attention to it, 4chan wasn't actually that interested in it anymore. It was not a lot of activity going on there. It moved on to the next big thing. So it's kind of a wave pattern where um, platforms follow each other in their attention and it, as it moves up to kind of the, the upper half of the internet, um, platforms are a little later but there are more people on there so more people see it so they bring it to a, a more mainstream audience, a wider audience that uh, wouldn't maybe believe it if they saw it on 4chan but would believe it if they saw it in the Washington Post. So it's not so much uh, a leap from the upper left corner to the lower left corner, but it's a gradual process from platform to platform where something starts in a very fringe way, in a way that, you, that normies wouldn't understand uh, on the, the weird interface in the, in the weird vernacular of 4chan and 8chan. Gradually from Reddit to YouTube, um, Facebook, mainstream media, and then finally it's suddenly um, QAnon is a legit thing, or at least in the minds of a lot of people, and they bring it up at political rallies, they bring it up in support of Donald Trump. So, what does this tell us? Um, QAnon is still bullshit, but at least we understand maybe a little bit more how something so evidently bullshitty, if you look into it, becomes something that's a big thing. That's a big thing in American politics that gets mentioned at political rallies. Um, and if you would think it's just a leap from the upper left to the lower left, then it's, it's kind of weird how, how does something so fringe become so mainstream. But if you 
recognize that it's a gradual process and goes from platform to platform, each adding a little more credibility to it, then maybe um, it's a little clearer how something, how bullshit does become normified. So on that slightly depressing note, um, I give the floor to Emily, who will take you into the next type of bullshit, Kekistan. Wait a little bit. So, this uh, presentation about Kazakhstan, uh, where I will try to explain what about what the meme is exactly to you guys, um, does resemble a little bit to the presentations by Stein and Emilia to a certain extent, in that it's also a description of a meme that initially emerged from 4chan and then traveled to other platforms, and as it did over time, also changed meanings over time, right? But the particularity here that we have to understand about Kazakhstan as a form of bullshit, rhetorically, is that um, it, it, as a meme, it used bullshit for more, um, you would say, politically uh, activistic reasons, right? So it used elements of the sort of indifference to truth and uh, certain elements of deception to convey a certain criticism, mainly of, uh, you would say, liberal political thought and what they call social justice warriors and identity politics and so on. So what's interesting to note is that uh, before actually it acquired its meaning as a, or its function, right, uh, as, a, as, a, as part of a political campaign that was mostly focused on YouTube eventually, it emerged from 4chan. And as 4chan, there, as it developed over the years from roughly 2012 till today, or you would say 2017, um, it kind of developed as a sort of real, um, you would say, active, uh, indifference to reality, right? It was just pure playfulness that it emerged as. So, for instance, Kekistan was first born, uh, well, the, the term Kekistan came from uh, the term Kek. Kek uh, emerged in 2012, you would say, it was an alternative to saying lol in World of Warcraft. And that's what Anons on Fortune use most of the times too, as an alternative to lol, right? So from Kek, uh, you would see first emergencies of emergences of the, the term Kekistan as a synonym or as another term to refer to real countries, uh, such as Central Asian countries. Instead of saying Kyrgyzstan, you would say Kekistan for humorous reasons. Or you would say Kekistan to refer to a country with, for Anons, a certain negative connotation for having too many Muslim immigrants and so on and so forth. So from a refer to a real country, what's interesting is that eventually it started to refer to a fake country, but with real proportions, at least on 4chan. So Kekistan eventually became a sort of a fictitious online nation state that Anand wanted to build. Um, at first, by having the idea of buying a private island for themselves and having uh, all Anand's live there together, finally, in their own f physical uh, area, you would say, of the world, and having and practicing certain neo-Nazi policies as the main status quo. Um, as that idea developed, the idea started to become actually to have a real consequent online nation state that would have its own, for instance, religion, right? It's not just its own policies, which usually alienate with far-right uh, political ideas, but also its own religion as what they call esoteric Kekism, 
which is the belief, uh, combines certain beliefs in Buddhism, and notably this, this belief in meme magic, <laughs> which is uh, the idea that memes, uh, as they travel uh, in the web, are able to change culture, right? And are quite instrumental in the culture wars in that sense. So besides having uh, a series of political ideas and a series of, well, a religion in itself, eventually Kekistan also acquired a sort of um, mythical uh, dimension, right? It, 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 Anans also sort of coined their own myth of the Kekistanis as having been a people that long ago in a galaxy far, far away were sort of um, driven out by their land, in their land, Kekistan, by the normies of new fag land. Um, and that's so, sort of a, an illusion, interesting, rhetorically speaking, as a bullshit, as an illusion, that even though the, the, the story is, is false, it alludes somewhat to the reality of the online culture wars. Uh, as Mark said earlier, is the Anon's feeling that they have been sort of driven out of their original lands online, um, and especially on social media platforms where liberal uh, users have sort of taken over and platforms are being guided by liberal masterminds like Mark Zuckerberg, who believes in identity politics and who restricts free speech to a series of uh, doctrines having to do with identity politics. So what's interesting there is that as the, um, you would say, fake identity of Kekistan came to be coined on 4chan, Sargon of Akkad, uh, which I'm not sure you guys know, but is a celebrity, you would say, a all lightish British celebrity from uh, YouTube, uh, noticed the meme on 4chan and decides to make fun of the British census one day by submitting an application to it uh, for Kekistan to, and Kekistanis to be recognized at its own, as their own ethnicity, right, with their own culture and religion and so on. The point then is that as the meme exploded on YouTube, where Sargon of Akkad region belongs, um, Kekistan also became bullshit in the sense that it was a sort of uh, disguise for um, an identity, and it consisted in uh, baiting liberal users into believing into that identity, believing that Kekistan was a real thing with its own flag that you guys can see here, was molded into, was juxtaposed into the, the, the flag of the Third Reich, and uh, seemed to have all this, uh, these sort of far-right political ambitions. Um, it consisted in having, uh, baiting liberal users to believing that that identity was real, and in doing so, validating the fact that identity is a bullshit idea in itself, right? So that, that was very much the, the rhetorical function of bullshit for Kyrgyzstan. So as that happened, what's interesting is that um, with the use of very provocative elements, so uh, Nazi symbolism and imagery and ideas and so on, the idea of Kyrgyzstan as bullshit was also to sort of disrupt um, the truth-telling, the sanctimonious truth-telling of liberal political thought and the so-called justice, social justice warriors and uh, identity politics. The idea was to use sort of taboo imagery to try to uh, sort of disrupt the, the, the taboos, the political correctness for being so strict, so being so obsessed about truth itself and, and correctness keeps intact, right? Um, and in doing so, what's interesting is that um, it, it brings the arena of the, you know, the battle of ideas and political debate from an arena from, well, it brings that political debate from an arena to uh, argumentation, of argumentation, to that of caricature, right? So in making fun of liberal users and liberalism in, ge in general, um, it does not just undermine the truths of the idea of that political, uh, you would say, belonging, but it also undermines the very power of that truth, the truth of liberalism, right? The truth of those liberal users. So what's interesting ultimately also is that the point of Kyrgyzstan as bullshit was not necessarily just to, um, you would say, coin a message with its own truth. Instead, it was to coin a message that was provocative enough to be disseminated as far as possible on the web. In this, in this particular case on YouTube, what you see here is a network of videos related to each other that all refer uh, to Kyrgyzstan. As you see, every little dot, of course, the, the quality of the image is not great, but every little dot there is, an, is a video, so there are hundreds and thousands of videos referring to Kyrgyzstan. The, you know, the meme became very popular, et cetera, et cetera. 
The point is that by being, by being disseminated as such, it would finally land into the minds and to the attentions of people that it would not have gotten the attention in the first place. So that could be, for instance, MSNBC that also reported on Kakistan as, a, as what they thought was a hate symbol or the Southern Poverty Law Center or ultimately also this very audience here that we're having. No, no, uh, back to the presentation. So this is the other uh, Right, my name is uh, Daniel, and I'm gonna present uh, shortly on these uh, visualization that we're developing, uh, uh, the Encyclopedia Dramatica Explorer. So one of the things to counter the ephemerality of 4chan and 8chan is uh, not only uh, the use of general threats, but also to use this kind of um, satirical uh, fake uh, Wikipedia site where all the um, beautiful bullshit of Chang culture is um, uh, stored and archived for eternity, um, which sounds scary if you say it like that. Um, and the site itself is not really meant for normies, to say the least. It's it's organized, it's first in the, in the vernacular of 4chan itself, so you have to be really a Chan connoisseur to be able to navigate uh, this uh, weird landscape. And what we did was um, <clears throat> we, uh, we looked at the top 5,000 images uh, on the Encyclopedia Dramatica and we processed those images through the Google Vision API, which uh, allows allows you to extract a meaningful uh, uh, data uh, from the images. So Google looks at uh, the online context in which these images appear, and it can guess uh, using a probability score what those images are about. So for now, this is really a, a, a in an early phase of development. So here, here are some of the categories uh, that uh, you can uh, select. So one of the uh, uh, categories that Google extracted from the images. And you're able to uh, select individual categories and then you'll see all the images that are associated with it. So in this case, one part of the kind of giant blob of images will be about video games, which is an important part of uh, this kind of weird uh, uh, male internet culture. Uh, you're also uh, able, you can select an image, so the one, the Kirby one in, in the top, you can see what, what labels and categories uh, the Google Vision API has associated with it. So more formal characteristics and more uh, semantic uh, connotations that it found online. So this is like uh, what it looks like from up close. Um, in this case, the, the video game section. So a weird, weird combination of of memes. Of course, there's the uh, Nazi uh, paraphernalia uh, on the top. So you can see if you navigate this giant network, uh, you can see how the different themes are interrelated. And there's a whole large part of the network that I'm not going to show, which is quite problematic to say, uh, and which uh, I will spare you tonight. So these are an, an overview of the bigger, uh, bigger map. And I just want to quickly, if we can switch to the live view, because a lot of the images also are uh, GIFs, so they're animated. Uh, 
And here I selected the category of cats, which is of course the official animal of the internet, as you all know. Um, and you see some of the famous, famous cats like Lol Cats and Neon Cat here. And when you deselect, ultimately the whole network should appear and you're able to navigate and look at the pictures at different zoom levels to more or less disturbing effects. So that's, that's it for me, thanks. supposed to be kind of, well, I have a live slideshow, yes. So, um, um, yeah, oh, oh, then of course, yes, then I will. So, um, as you see, there is more puppets, or there have been more puppets, and there are more uh, newly, hopefully, newly to be made puppets on your chairs. Um, so just shortly, something about that. I'm, um, so I'm Kim, I'm uh, um, from... Mona Lisa's, it's an artist collective uh, from Rotterdam. And um, we are with three. Uh, have, yeah, for a long time already been fascinated by, by meme culture, um, especially uh, as a, um, well, since it's uh, um, the way it's structured, uh, uh, let's say as an, as an artist, I'm fascinated by the way in which uh, fantasies are being made up, uh, shared, um, passed on, and how this whole evolution of, let's say, the, the shared idea is actually working within internet culture. And um, we don't only look at internet culture, we're actually more broader to, um, let's say, contemporary folk, and well, where is that? That's, for one, that is meme culture, but we're also looking more into more historical examples of um, memes, for example, the flying saucer, or, you know, more folky examples, because actually folk is also quite memetic. And we're interested in that, in the collective making of shared ideas. Um, and, I, and I actually feel that right now, with, let's say, all the examples you've just seen of the conspiracies and what's going on on 4chan, is that there's such, really, so much fantasy and, uh, in that sense, actually shared ideas being fed going on and I'm really fascinated by that. I, um, I'm interested in yeah, uh, the, the, the techniques in, uh, that are being uh, developed and applied uh, to find out, well, to create and fantasize about these alternative realities and um, uh, how to, to build them also. So, uh, but for this project you actually see that um, this is one, of, one type of project that we do. If I would say, if I would split it up in two kinds, we have one kind of project that's more typically like this, which is to open up, um, let's say this topic, um, this was about the great meme war to a bigger audience and actually to, well, in that way, actually not talk about it, but really invite people. This was a, to a play. This was, a, we call it now like a, it was a, yeah, it was a play, a theatrical participatory play, I would say, with four stages in which people were, yeah, um, um, invited to uh, step into this world of, of 4chan, of the more, yeah, the underbelly of the web. Um, this is uh, our, our, our sweet, uh, big Yabba, um, of which I actually made a smaller version for Mark's video, which maybe if you noticed, the first video was actually our, now our little Yabba. Um, um, so what so what happened here is that um, yeah um, we wanted to 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 open this uh, this this story because it's actually yeah an interesting and great story about the the, the great meme war and um, well okay so we we thought there is idea wars going on and um, since we are artists we of course we yeah we are it's all about ideas and um, we feel that. 
being part of these ideas, knowing what they're about is relevant and interesting. So I invited people here to, besides first, um, um, let's say, experiencing uh, the whole great meme war being narrated by our big Yaba, um, to then actually step into a next room and then meet your characters. Well, so today, actually, you're also meeting your characters. I hope everyone has one uh, now um, also chosen, maybe. Uh, the idea was that people would make their puppet. Um, um, if you open the label up, you can actually do it. Um, uh, you see you, you, you have a character, and there is also a catchphrase uh, in the label. So, for example, there's a feminazi, there's a, there's a red pillar, um, there's Donaldus. So these are all characters that I really, I did not make them up. They, of course, they all took them uh, from uh, uh, 4chan and from, from the web. Um, also, what they're saying is actually, uh, it's quite nicely uh, um, um, saved all these, uh, these character lines. Um, and, well, the idea is that uh, people would make, of course, this puppet, and the function of this puppet um, is really to, well, if you read your catchphrase, to, to sort of feel what it would, well, how would it feel to actually say these words? So one is to, to, to sort of step into this other character, which I think this form of identity play is also going on um, uh, on 4chan, so these anons are actually, of course, also continuously doing this identity play, testing out what you can say or cannot say. And this is also what we wanted to achieve then when making the puppet and being in front of a camera with just your puppet like this, um, to, to, to stress that that is what, what's going on and, well, to um, have you uh, yeah, uh, feel that, let's say, what would that feel like if I would say this? this particular phrase. Um, uh, yeah, and today, so I'm inviting you to take one home. Uh, <laughs> please make one. Uh, it's very easy. It seems uh, it's uh, very folky and easy to make just two eyes and then start talking. Um, so please, please, um, yeah, I would be happy uh, to see more of them online uh, using maybe some nice hashtag, hashtag such as bullshit. Sock puppets, yeah. Sorry, Mona Lisa's, yes. Uh, um, impact. I mean, but let's, uh, yeah, let's get some more pocket, uh, puppets on the web. Um, yeah, that was it. Thank you. Yeah. Going, I'm moderating, so I would like everybody to join me on stage if they would. Also you, please, Kim. And um, we, uh, so you've seen, you've seen Bullshit's birthplace now. And there are, there's a microphone there which works. Yes? Okay. So we'll use these two microphones. There's three microphones. Okay. So uh, you've seen Bullshit's birthplace. You've uh, also been shown a number of peculiar conspiracy theories, and you've just sort of scratched the surface of some also rather disturbing things. So I would like to... Uh, I, we all know each other, so of course we could have a conversation about things that we know about, but this may be relatively new for you in the audience. So I would like to uh, see if I might solicit some questions from the audience, perhaps points of clarification or points of contention that you might like to engage with. And am I supposed to then carry the microphone into the audience as well? No. Not, okay. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fourth microphone over there. Yes, there's somebody here. Oh, who... Thank you all so much. I learned quite a bit today. Um, I'm sorry, yes, and I'm supposed to reiterate your question if they don't get it well, on, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I really love the topic of this confirmation bias that's going on and people getting really sucked into the narrative that's being created by themselves. Um, so I lecture in artificial intelligence and I was just imagining creating a conspiracy generator that could perhaps even steer the direction that some conspiracy is like going into, perhaps. Um, but then I was wondering, like. Would there be some, some mechanic that would make people aware of their own like thought patterns, their own like 
things that they act upon, like why are we doing this, like why am I reacting in this way, why am I responding in some manner, that could like teach people something instead of like getting this like this continuation of bullshit, you know, like something positive coming out of this. Uh, I don't know what that would be, but could it be done or is this some hopeless thought I have here? Well, Thanks. <laughs> I, of course, don't have the answer to the billion dollar question. It's a great question. Uh, but I know that there are all sorts of plugins that are being developed, you know, for, for one to see how balanced uh, one's, you would say, originally media diet is, but that could also be platform diet. Uh, what kind of content you visit? Uh, is it too much on, on one political spectrum over the other? There are educational tools like that, but as far as I know, I don't think they happen to be too successful. So. I think the emphasis at the moment is that platforms sort of take on that responsibility for making, uh, you would say, one one's browsing patterns a little bit more apparent, and for for pe for users to be a little bit more self-conscious about it, right? For those platforms to reflect one's users' behaviors and preferences a little bit more. Yeah. Um, yeah. To add to that, there's. As Emily said, there are these plugins. For example, there's a plugin that shows you whether a video on YouTube is legit or uh, manipulated, I think. Um, the problem, though, is that a lot of these people that do engage with these conspiracy theories are rather distrustful of mainstream media. Um, and, and, and most inst uh, institutions trying to develop this kind of plugin or fact-checking are either traditionally part of the mainstream media or seen to be as, as part of the mainstream media. So there's a more fundamental problem of distrust there that you can't really solve with fact-checking or plugins. Um, because the fact checks and the plugins themselves won't be believed, so you just add to the conspiracy basically as, as another thing to to add to the, this huge map of conspiracies and problems and bad actors, etc. So, um, yeah, that's a, again a slightly negative answer, but uh, it's a, it's a bigger problem than than fact checking, I think. Uh, I, I would add one more thing to that. That, um, that, the, that way of thinking of conspiracies, it seems to me, is a little bit in line with that theory that conspiracies, conspiracy theorists operate from a position of like low information, and that if they had more or better or correct information, that they would not get involved in that. But that's a kind of, you could say that's a kind of like a liberal theory in a way that it doesn't sort of, it's not open to the idea that there are kind of a plurality of different possible positions on things and that there is, that we should be able to meet in some sort of a consensus position. And that's, pro that, that there would be, some p people in political theory would object to that idea, uh, if, you know, at, at the get-go. Um, so that may be another reason why you may not succeed with such an effort. Um, also, uh, relatedly, although it was kind of maybe embedded in your previous question, coming from, I, I'm often um, asked by people who uh, are interested in or who work uh, with uh, AI and bots and stuff, couldn't we, you know, intervene into this space and sort of, uh, if not kind of correct them, then maybe so, you know, chaos, like a good kind of chaos. Um, and um, to sort of steer things in a different direction uh, because it's, you know, it couldn't possibly be any worse. And uh, my, actually, my response to that is that, no, I don't think I would, I think that would be a very, I know that AI is super sophisticated, but I think that this would be an unbelievably complex challenge because the, the, um, the vernacular, ways of speaking move so incredibly rapidly in this space that it's very difficult for humans to actually keep up. So I think it would be th quite a challenge for a programmer to be able to uh, figure that out. But you know, who knows, maybe, maybe programs would, would be uh, interesting to, to try out in that situation. I kind of doubt it, but thank you. Um, so uh, yes, there is a question in the back row on the left. Uh, yes, sorry. Oh, it was a bit too loud. Um, uh, this was about like uh, the the side of um, 4chan, which is a specific corner of the internet, 
but now we moved on to um, the more general pattern of um, how we filter information, like how we stand towards um, uh, what's being called the traditional or the mainstream media. Um, so what I was missing, for example, is like the uh, the side of Tumblr as sort of the the uh, one of the places where sort of left-wing activism has developed its own vernacular and its own things in the way like how also on platforms like Facebook or the, the sort of other demographics have their own forms of uh, own the political cultures and conspiracy theories or like whatever. So I was I was like wondering. Um, to what extent it is fruitful to um, only look at one place and then distance ourselves to it from, okay, this is bullshit, and sort of seeming like our own position in the landscape of ideas, and questioned as like, but what we believe is obviously the truth, and what they believe is um, bullshit as, as a way of labeling it. A sort of, yeah. Maybe as an interesting data point here, there's, there's 4chan and also 8chan, which I briefly mentioned in my presentation. And there is actually a rather infamous um, leftist sub, sub forum on, on 8chan. Um, you know, the, the one on 4chan is poll, politically incorrect. And then on 8chan, you have lefty poll, which is kind of the same thing, but left. Um, the thing is that by comparison, it's far smaller than. Uh, 4chan's poll, and also it's been around for a shorter time. So if we look at kind of the, the things that filter through from, in this case, 4chan, or in, in a more general sense, the, the fringe web, to the mainstream, to the, the actual big political debates, to the um, election results that we see in different countries right now, a lot of that is uh, can be found on 4chan, unfortunately, is kind of right-wing oriented. And I, I think um, there is a case to be made that if it hasn't been there yet, the left is certainly mobilizing in these spaces, as we see on, on lefty poll. But in terms of actually facts that we can study over a longer period of time, um, there's less there, at least in the context we look at, which is... Uh, but that's why I was talking about Tumblr and not lefty poll. I think that like um, when you talk about a certain uh, demographic, this this early internet, sort of early cyber culture that, that, that you know, developed into message port culture, is a very specific demographic with a lot of overlap with um, video gamers and um, uh, which, yeah, which is usually like a white male um, in the West uh, type of culture. Um, whereas like other demographics or even like people in other countries, they they you know might have like similar type of um, this is very anthropological, like very human type of uh, uh, effects. How politics can be really steered by like pockets of ideas spreading in a mimetic fashion um, and which is not only like uh, something that 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 is happening here like this is only one of the uh, uh, places um, and a very influential place because it, it has such a like a culture that, that dates back for so long but it's it's um, like the internet's power to um, bring people together from different sort of sites or like different places. Um, I think that I, th I take your point that 4chan and 4chan style culture certainly doesn't cover everything or ev ev every political movement that has been around. And you're very right that um, there's other stuff out there besides this kind of problematic uh, right-wing culture that we see on, um, on 4chan. And I don't think our, our message or what we want to say here is necessarily that what we discuss here generalizes to political subculture online in general. But it is a, a part of political online subculture that um, has been, can be connected to, to measurable stuff that has been happening in big elections and big societies around the world. And that's why um, in terms of real world in impact, it's something that's especially interesting to study here. I don't know, maybe Mark wants to add something to that. Uh, yeah. I. I, I understand your question as a little bit in the category of the question of w the why why can't the left meme that kind of type of question and uh, they do um, there that's a that's a question that is often brought up and and uh, but I think you're saying something more like yes they they, they can and they're they're elsewhere and and, and that, that that perhaps they're on Tumblr and I. Mm, 
there, there is uh, some something interesting uh, in um, Instagram that we have been wanting to look into. Um, there are these very niche political subcultural identities, extremely narrow forms of political identification um, amongst teenagers uh, who, with that, uh, that are all kind of across the political spectrum, uh, including right wing, but also lots of different colors of left wing, go, but going way off to the far totalitarian end of the spectrum as well. Um, and there are a great many forms of that kind of like LARPing at politics going on. Also, there are many subreddits that are devoted to that. There's like full communism and so on. And they have a lot of fun with Stalin and things like that. Um, so there is, a, there is a lot of different stuff uh, besides what we were talking about here. Things that are worth looking into and that um, would, and if you are interested in doing that, that's something that we also do together as well in particular in these kind of research environments where we sit together and look at this stuff. And um, that is one of the things that we do intend on doing uh, next time we do one of these collective research exercises. Um, but uh, that having been said, I think that uh, indeed this particular environment, these these because partially because of the affordances that uh, in particular Emilia were, was outlining, and also just historically, the, these pla the, these places that we're talking about happen to be ex particularly productive of this kind of vernacular culture. And for whatever reason, which is complex, and I tried to touch on it, they are also kind of in a particularly reactionary direction at the moment. Though they not have not always been, and I don't think we have to assume that they will always be either. There's a question in the front row. Um, I, I don't know if any of you is familiar with Jordan Greenhall. Um, he, he's a technologist and a thinker, and he had these intriguing comments about QAnon that, of course, the contents are very pathological and all that. But um, he said, and I don't know if, if that um, resonates, but um, that the way in which um, the QAnon um, dialogue and collaboration happens is extremely elaborate, um, and that even even that his, it has no precedent. That um, the magnitude of it is bigger than Wikipedia or something like that. I don't. I must, might be mis misrepresenting, but he was somehow assuming or saying that uh, there was something radically new in the way people collaborated on 4chan and other places in order to create the QAnon conspiracy theory. Is that correct? Does that make sense? I, there are other people sitting here who know more about QAnon than I, so I will just, um, I will just uh, sort of preface with uh, the point that this kind of rhetoric of how there's something new and unprecedented going on in uh, online collaboration is a kind of a discourse in our field that that has been around for at least, uh, um, I don't know, 15 years or so, the, the, the theory of the hive mind. Um, and uh, that it's, uh, it was, I think, it was generally associated with these kind of progressive movements and so forth and um, stuff like fan culture that was kind of a little bit irrelevant to many people. Um, and it's now that it's become involved in these sort of like, sort of more uh, sort of, I guess, things that we don't like, that it becomes then a bit more um, uh, uh, perhaps problematic and of concern. But I, I think that, you know, the conspiracy mills were running pr at full steam already uh, when the, around the time of 9-11 um, and around that particular issue, and a great many other issues. So I'm not sure if there, what exactly the quantitative sort of uh, difference is there, but perhaps um, others would like to speak to that. Um, I agree that there's something maybe even beautiful in how these people working on QAnon work together and produce these very elaborate and very well organized um, 
schematics of how the whole theory works and how they add up every single breadcrumb to, to have a part in the whole. And I don't know if that's necessarily a revolution in, in how thought is organized, but it's certainly something that you see popping up, and not just with QAnon, but also with the Pizzagate conspiracy, for example, where they had a similar pattern of, of creating these, these schematics. I mean, Emilia shows some very good examples there. Um, and maybe the tragic thing is that this, this process is quite beautiful and brings maybe it brings out some of the best characteristics of people, but the building blocks are all pure bullshit. So the end result is still not that useful or even um, quite problematic. So there's, I, th I guess it depends on whether you're a glass half full kind of person, um, whether you appreciate that part more or whether you find the problems with the, the, the building blocks of that process more problematic. But it certainly, it is an interesting process, yeah. I guess what I wanted to add about Pizzagate, but before you kind of conclude it with your beautiful um, half glass bullshit uh, metaphor, um, is that we see, uh, for example, in the case of Pizzagate, how they use brilliantly those uh, external archives, uh, for example, Google Docs, to uh, collect all the information and kind of make the connections there or paste bin. Um, so that's a minor point that I wanted to add. My like f feeling, but I don't know if, like perhaps Daniel, you have another thought on this because you did do some work on conspiracy. My feeling is that if there's something kind of new about it, but maybe that's because of where we're looking at uh, and that's that we're looking at the bottom part of the the, the hierarchy where it's very hard to believe people <laughs> that they really that they really believe what they're doing. It's it's in, in that space. There's a kind of an epistemological problem there, where it's it's everything is so drenched in irony, and there's so much of a desire to shitpost people that um, to me, what seems kind of new about it is that 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 is their relationship with belief that they're kind of they 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 are in they're participating in these conspiracy theories because it's you know they get off on it like it's funny to make to see it spread to see like trump for example their 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 fondness for trump i don't know that they had any great sort of belief in this guy he was funny and let sort of seemed like them full of shit and so on and so uh, there's, uh, to me, if there's something new, it's like this kind of bizarre, ironical relationship with belief. Um, but of course, once the conspiracy gets kind of uh, normified, then it, 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 it becomes something different. So I'm speaking more about in the kind of actual birth, birthing stages of the, of the theories there, where I think that that might be some sort of new, but... If I may add something, this brings to mind, that, you know, because you, you're speaking about irony, but it seems to me that it's a more oscillation between irony and seriousness, yeah. because they do take politics seriously to some extent. And, um, you know, there's, there's this meta-modern meta thing, which is a new trend, and, and, it, and it speaks about that, about, you know, you know, retreating from reality and going back to reality, going from irony to seriousness and things like that. Without the uh, other, um, but um, they, they they have a very specific relationship with metamodernism. Actually, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of that. It's uh, they they trolled metamodernism like brutally, actually, with the 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 installation that uh, Luke Taylor is that his name? Luke Taylor did with uh, Shia, Shia LaBeouf uh, that was inspired. That was a metamodernist uh, art installation. Um, that was intended to, you know, um, perform this kind of post-ironic sincerity um, uh, around, and that was the whole, the, the, the mantra, what was it again? He, he will not divide us, right? So they, they just made a brutal mockery of that uh, and made it into a, a kind of a more, uh, well, I'm not sure if I'm willing to go there today. <laughs> it became a very bizarre artwork uh, in the end. Um, as a result of that, um, 
which was interesting, but also extremely troubling for the artist as well. Anybody want to add anything to, are there any other questions that we have? Um, in the context of irony and sincerity, um, and going back to what you talked about with uh, Kekistan and the mainstream reporting on it, uh, it seems like there's a catch-22 that if you report on it sincerely, yes, they're using hate symbology or hate symbols. Um, th this is uh, playing into their hands. So is there a more effective way that that could be reported on or analyzed? Where's Kim? I think, Kim, your, your technique, in my opinion. <laughs> Sorry, I should, uh, but, but, but perhaps... I, I think I, I would like to say that, yes, that is a problem, and that's a recognized problem, particularly for journalists, which we're not. However, um, that doesn't make us uh, sort of, uh, you know, inoculated against that either. I don't think that we, nor for that matter, should journalists, should journalists avoid talking about things because there is this possibility that that is going to provide an amplification. However, it is something that people should definitely be aware of and then proceed accordingly. Um, but I do think that there's something very interesting in the way that Kim's work takes this kind of like, does a sort of a, a detournement of this, this culture. And I find that very effective. I think that that technique, that detournement technique is of limited value in the world that we live in today, in my opinion. I think it's kind of an out-of-date technique, but for some reason it works really well here, to my, to my mind. Um, the, and it's not necessarily a question of mm, making an explicit critique of the thing, but just somehow exposing its ex ridiculousness and just playing it back to itself in, its, in those terms. So to me that I found a very kind of interesting strategy that, um, that in, in relation to this conversation around the problem of how do you kind of um, address this without um, feeding into it. That's, that's one of the reasons why I like Kim's work so much, actually. It's more of a compliment, actually, than an... Uh, Kim, are there any concerns that uh, a normal person would read one of these and have those words spoken in their own voice and go home and think, this is kind of interesting. This resonates with me. Um, uh, yes, whether that would be, well, what do you think? I think you think so, right? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what's happened on these platforms is people have played into it and it's become a kind of a sincere political belief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to sort of, you know, keep people away from ideas and things like that? I mean, that seems like a very patronizing attitude. I mean, it seems to me that you should address address whatever it is that attracts people to these things in order to then perhaps diffuse whatever that attraction might be or else take some other strategy where you can kind of like mock its kind of ridiculousness, but to somehow kind of turn away from it because it's it's sort of too too much for people is I mean I do think that when it came to the for example the Christchurch thing I did think I did think that that was a a kind of a classy move that people that the the journalists didn't that they sort of blacked out a lot of that stuff around that event and that was just such a horrendous thing and the, and to give any sort of um, platform to that person's you know, um, uh, manifesto would have been, I think, very dubious. But um, that's, uh, that's, you know, we're, that's really at the super, super far end of the scale there. Um, so, yeah. But I mean, of course, that's, the, the, in that case, that is totally legitimate, in my opinion. Questions that, from the audience, uh, Aryan has a question. Um, I'm curious what um, triggered Harry Frankfurt to write his original essay on bullshit, because it couldn't have been the internet as we know it. It was written in 1986. And in connection with that, uh, when it was republished, was it published in the exact same way, or was there 
any or well, 2005 any kind of okay and this is where we live now was it different from the original essay Amelia, you're the last person who gave it a close reading aren't you um, what was going on in what was going on in uh, the US in 1986 that was the sort of l latter period of Reaganism I imagine a period when people were very dispirited who had a certain kind of a political um, identity who felt that they had been in the doldrums uh, for a long time uh, there was Reagan had an incredible ability to I mean, he didn't lie in the way that Trump did, but he told sort of, he, he, it's, he, told, he told, I would say he told lies that he himself believed, as opposed to Trump who tells lies who he doesn't, that he doesn't even believe. That's how I would kind of, that's how I at least remember it. Um, and uh, so I guess that may well have been the context for coming up with this kind of theory of the power of narratives to be able to weave realities that have little to do with the objective state of things because of course in at this point there was it was a complete d d an utter destruction of the you know American working class which has you know finally come home to roost now some some th uh, 30 uh, years later um, so and that ver so the, the 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 image of politics that people encountered, I guess, at that period of, in American history, was very different from their lived experience. So perhaps that might account for why it came up at that moment in time. I think the published in two thousand five. Yeah, this, apparently the, the it was originally published in the eighties. Oh, and then we have a, okay. what we're what we're talking about now is a uh, the the new version of the essay, which is Aryan's point. I see. Okay. I thought uh, when I reread it res recently, I was a bit, um, and then when I had to do this presentation about Pakistan, I was somewhat uh, a bit torn inside in that the the argument that that bullshit that well that Harry Frankfurt makes about bullshit that it's even more dangerous than lying, right? In that uh, the bullshitter is completely indifferent to truth, right? He just improvises, he or she just improvises, whatever for the sake of you know, uh, manipulating a certain reality in any given way. Um, uh, on the other hand, like in the story of Kazakhstan, there is a certain political, uh, you would say, utility to it, in, especially in, in that particular story, and that it would be uh, useful to sort of trying to play a little bit with sort, sorts of taboos that truth speaking would not be able to attenuate, you know, would not be able to resolve. So questions having to do with identity politics and whatnot, what they like to call identity politics, that in the end playfulness is maybe, and, and the bullshit that comes with it maybe is the only way to sort of, you know, poke it a little bit and have people discuss uh, discuss about it a little bit more. That that I think is the argument that the Pakistanis would present, you know, in uh, a defense of bullshit, you would say. But <laughs> I'm not sure it's a it's a good one. Yeah. Um. I would maybe add one more thing, uh, Aryan, about you know, so, so it was your it was your uh, suggestion that we engage with this concept, and I, uh, I I'm not like generally a sort of a big fan of uh, analytic philosophy, although I did find this text interesting, um, and um, it's quite short text, and I recommend it to people if you haven't read it. Um, uh, and so, you know, analytic philosophy usually deals with kind of problems of uh, logic and and so forth. And so he's trying to basically, he's an epistemologist, and he's trying to come up with a kind of a category for a new type of knowledge. And um, and, and I outlined that at the beginning. Um, I think that what we talked about in our presentation was all about 4chan, and, um, and, and that is indeed a place where I hopefully we... You found our argument convincing that uh, bullshit in which a place in which bullshit is born, but bullshit. But uh, if you look kind of ecologically at the problem of bullshit in the United States, which is what we've been primarily talking about here, while these stories did make it into Trump's rallies and onto mainstream media and uh, might have, in the case of Pizzagate, had like a tiny marginal effect on the election. Um, maybe on the, on the, um, maybe on the level of like Russian trolls, I would say about that at that level. 
um, it's not a major factor, just like the Russian trolls are not a major factor. It's endemic in the American political system, and it has been like that for 40 years. And it's gotten to a point that is so bad, as you saw on that graphic there, it's like completely off the charts from other countries. The problem of distrust in, in, establish, in established, all established institutions. So, you know, people are, it's like, an, it's, it's like kind of a crazy experiment that is going on with thought in, in that country, um, where there's like this radical opening of possibilities for just new ways of thinking about what reality could be, where you can sort of entertain, yeah, you know, maybe actually Mueller and Trump are working together and all previous presidents have been pedophiles and all this kind of crazy stuff. Um, why not? You know, because my life certainly isn't, doesn't make much more sense than that, the way that things are going. If you have any ideas on this. Personally, I felt the past couple of weeks a little bit blindsided by this eternal focus we seem to have here in the Netherlands on what's happening on Trump. I don't know with you guys, but for us every morning at breakfast, like, what did he say today? You know, and we were giggling about it, making fun of him. Then the Brexit came. I mean, I'm amusing myself daily with the, the best viral jokes on May and the, the incarnations, etc. And one morning I woke up and Baudet was one of the biggest parties in the Netherlands. How do you see this in relation to this bullshit birthplace? Has this an online component? Is this something that set a precedent for other people to, to just sell bullshit with blue eyes as if it was the truth? People are ignoring strange effects of uh, sarcasm, um, bullying minorities in any sense of the way and still being elected in places with serious power. H how do you see this in relation to, to your focus on, the, as you mentioned, the American situation? Um, recently, we actually looked at... Uh, there, there's We talked about general threats, right, on 4chan, where um, people kind of collect discussions on a certain topic, and there is actually a Dutch general threat on 4chan's uh, politics sub, sub forum as well. And it's very much focused on uh, Cherry Bardet. And if you look at the kind of vernacular they use, the kind of way, the, the way they phrase their thoughts, it's very similar to the discussions on Trump. So in that sense, you could say that that kind of thought has infiltrated Dutch politics as well. Um, I think we're lucky that so far it hasn't come to the level of a Dutch QAnon existing with some kind of bullshitter spreading bread, breadcrumbs of misinformation that add up to some major conspiracy theory in Dutch politics. So we're not quite at that level yet, but I think there is a cause for um, maybe concern in the way that we're, some Dutch political um, actors or people discussing Dutch politics are taking a page out of the, the American playbook and it's not, it's not a good playbook. So you do get these kinds of uh, conspiracy minded discussions about the climate, about um, what are the other talking points of the Forum for Democracy, immigration, etc. So yeah, there, there is some similarity there and it's weirdly similar even in terms of platforms that are used. So there's 4chan, um, you can find similar videos on YouTube that are focusing on the Forum for Democracy in, in how they talk about it, etc. You have something to add to that? But don't you think we, we should pay more attention? That because we are looking so much to the States now, we, we could use this knowledge and information to try to reveal what is happening now right here in the Netherlands, maybe, if, if this is the case. Yeah, I, I certainly think so. And I, I like to think we're doing that. Um, I think that the big difference is that for this, we can go back for four years and we have a lot of data that we can use there. It's been going on for a while shorter in the Netherlands. It's, um, so it's, it's kind of in a startup phase still, the research on that topic, but um, it's certainly something we, I would like to look at personally, and I've been sort of looking at, but results are still out. And maybe it has to do with something that's two-sided. On the one hand, what you're doing is tracing back in time, mm -hmm. so what has happened, and maybe what we partly need right now is looking ahead 
and see how these kind of mechanisms potentially do impact us on a very daily local level, which is at the moment really a problematic thing anyways for the internet, what the influence of this international developments is on the local. But we cannot trace this because it hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. So how could we forecast this, uh, pre-mediate this before, you know, we are in the same shit show as we are now, well, what, what you are describing here. Maybe it's too idealistic, but just a thought. Well, I think I agree with your point, um, but maybe Mark always has a good argument about um, media studies and effects and that we don't really study that, which maybe you want to re reiterate here. Well, yeah, I'm, well, I mean, it, yeah, we're not we're not in communication studies, so we don't really we we don't really focus on that part of of the, although our colleagues do, and they're very good, um, and we can work with them, but it's not our forte. Um, and as far as the sort of future end of the the thing goes, I mean, Paul, that's I guess that's where politicians kind of come in, and they. Um, that I could imagine that there certain parties could have better media strategies. Um, I couldn't say that from looking at it. Um, I, that seems quite clear to me. Um, but that these things are also, you know, much more complex than than I than than, than I perhaps understand they, because they involve all kinds of complicated issues having to do with uh, the kinds of things that people talk about when they talk about the problem of national populism, which are, you know, there's a lot of, you may not like the uh, way that politics goes with national populists, but their grievances are things that they feel are legitimate and they're, they're not going to go away because the people don't like them. And so it's a very difficult uh, period of history that uh, countries are moving into with, re with these kinds of issues and they're not easy things to deal with and like sort of filter bubble experiments aren't going to resolve those issues. You know, those are very complex issues. Um, and I don't know if we necessarily need to open that whole can of worms up in a discussion like this, because it's going so nicely. Um, but it is, it is a very, th th those are very um, difficult points that, that, that you can't just, there are no technical fixes for those kinds of things at all. I would also say something very similar to Mark, uh, to what Mark and, and Stein said before, that in the end, the, the problem with the bullshit is not necessarily the, the debunking of the, 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 you know, the falsity that's inherent to it, but having to deal with the, the story that it, that it tells, right? The, the myth that it, that we, that it retells. So the, the sorts of confirmation biases that it, that it keeps on perpetuating so that, Things having to do with a, a deeply, deeply uh, ingrained mistrust uh, in the government, as is the case in the United States, or uh, racial tensions here in Europe and the United States as well, as they have also been very deeply felt for so long. Or I can also think of Brazil, where I come from, where the, for instance, this never unresolved affection for authoritarianism has come back also in the form of various conspiracy theories and eventually the election of, of Bolsonaro, you know. Uh, in a sense, maybe it's something having to do more with having to do some sort of therapy or some entering the, into dialogue with these sorts of unresolved myths that have never really disappeared, you know, and that are uh, coming back in the form of these stories rather than, than uh, you know, uh, well uh, verified facts. So am I to take it that there are no more questions? Oh, yeah, there is, from a politician, no less. Is, isn't, there, isn't there a problem with uh, calling this uh, bullshit and uh, um, uh, um, saying that in the, in the birthplace it was all irony? And when we, uh, by saying it bullshit, you say, uh, I don't have to to s s say something about it because it isn't it's wrong, and in the normality it isn't uh, not more the the ironic way, but people believe in their distrust of uh, of left wing of the of the government and so. This isn't is the problem to call it uh, bullshit. Does anybody want to 
I mean, it is a it is a provocative title, which I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we do we have? Do we have do we have any? Uh, uh, that's my contribution. Do we have any? Uh, do we have any uh, other in engagements with the, that kind of question? Well, I, I would remember, for instance, one of the first pages of the essay by Frankfurt is that there is no theory, or there was no theory for bullshit. Uh, he would like to think up until he wrote the essay, right? That there was a sort of gap in in in, in knowledge regarding that, but. Uh, though the phenomenon was very much tangible and, and, and spoken about in reality, that bullshit is maybe a, a category of its own when it comes to rhetoric and when it comes to our relationship to truth. Uh, now more than ever, right, with the mercantilization of, of, of communication, information, and, and, and yeah, truth speaking and so on. So maybe there is some merit to that, uh, but yeah, maybe in the end it's a question of nuance also. Maybe one thing to add to that is that there's this axiom on the, of the internet of post-law where you can't really distinguish between a fundamentalist and someone who's pretending to be a fundamentalist because it's equally outrageous what they're saying. Um, and you run into a similar problem when you're looking at this stuff. I mean, they could be mean, could be taking this seriously, but they could also be doing it for their own enjoy, enjoyment. Um, so there's no empirical way to address that in that we there's no analysis we can do on the data to distinguish the actually serious posts from the people that are just pretending to be serious um, for their own enjoyment. So we need kind of an, a concept to deal with that. And I think here we use uh, bullshit in a very narrow way with uh, certain characteristics that we think applied in this situation, um, but not necessarily in a, in a throwaway manner where we say, oh, this is bullshit, we don't need to deal with it. We do need to deal with it. Um, but we do need to deal with it in a specific way. Um, taking into account the characteristics of this kind of rhetoric, this kind of uh, this discussion, this kind of discourse. Um, and hopefully we've done that in a responsible manner, but I don't think um, we ever wanted to suggest that we don't need to take it seriously just because it's bullshit. It's a rhetorical device and we need to treat it on its own, with its own merits, um, but we do need to treat it as a serious thing. That we're we're not uh, we d we don't have a, a I mean the, the the concept does have this sort of a normative uh, sort of dismissal built into it um, but we're not really we're, we're most of what we do and this has this is a kind of an uh, artifact of our discipline I guess is that we're we're looking at kind of the we're looking at the dynamics of things and. Um, so we have a kind of a distant approach from which perspective we're um, not necessarily kind of engaged with like the actual, like making normative judgments on the substantive kind of tr claims. Um, from another perspective, we look very closely at the kind of ethnographic um, ways that people do things, from which perspective we're also not necessarily interested in saying whether they're right or wrong. We're just interested in kind of understanding what the rules are within those communities. So we're not, so from both of those perspectives, we're not sort of necessarily engaged in these kind of decisions about um, the, these, these kind of, this, this normative time, type of engagement. Um, that's not to say that, and now I'm just reiterating Stein's point, that's not to say that those things shouldn't be said and that, that there aren't disciplines that that don't have something valuable to say there. Um, many of the things that we didn't focus on all of the sort of, um, you know, cyber bullying and things like that that go on, but a great deal of things like that go on and trolling and sort of negative antisocial behavior and disciplines like psychology and so forth would be necessary to engage in a dialogue to be able to sort of fully flesh out what's going on when those messages are received and other, and other places. So that's not what we were kind of talking about here. We were talking about the birthplace of um, bullshit and we were trying to offer a perspective, f uh, a kind of a close-up perspective on how the rules work within there and then a sort of a zoomed out perspective on how it kind of, what the dynamics of that are. Um, another concept that we could have taken on, and I don't know if this would engage either you, Daniel, or um, Amelia, is that we could have looked at kind of the way that in these communities, if we study them ethnographically, that what they're really doing, what they, what they see themselves as engaging in 
could be understood not so much in terms of bullshit, but in terms of like some kind of a some kind of play that they're engaged in some kind of um, play activity that they're that they that w for which there are these kind of complex rule sets and that there's these very sort of elaborate practices that they've kind of come up with, which you saw an extremely detailed visualization of that Amelia showed. Um, and then we could tr we could speak about it in those terms. We could speak about this some sort of um, idea of identity play, playing with reality, playing with what the internet is is for, what what you're supposed to do on the internet as opposed to what you're not supposed to do. There we could speak in different terms, but that wasn't the sort of overall frame. But if we were to take on that frame, I don't know if that's something that either of you two, since I haven't given, you haven't had an opportunity to speak really, um, if either of you two might it to speak to it at all. Um, but uh, yeah. Don't mean to put you on your feet like that. You're good? Well, at least I gave the opportunity, because I guess that's my job. Um, uh, but you can read our writings on those topics um, on our website, which is not there. Um, but uh, yeah, there is the, the website is, so the group, uh, our lab is called Open Intelligence Lab, and we have a blog where we cover the research that we do, which has primarily been into these anonymous uh, message boards, but is not exclusively concerned with that. It's primarily interested in political subcultures and sort of radical online identity, uh, whatever form that takes, but m mainly when in terms of in political terms. And um, so we also, I mentioned to a, uh, somebody in the audience earlier that we also kind of in, do these collective research activities. So we will do one of those in the summer, uh, in July, and it's kind of loosely affiliated with the Digital Methods Summer School. So for those of you who are interested in exploring this kind of work with us, you might be able to uh, have an opportunity to do so. And um, I would like to thank uh, Aryan for the invitation and Inez for the coordination and the, uh, these two gentlemen whose names I have not have slipped my mind for <laughs> the technical facilitation and Peter for the photography who I recognize him back there. I see him every time that I come to Impact. Hi, nice to see you, Peter. Um, and everybody for their uh, questions and engagement and I suppose that we can leave it at that. And so thank you very much.